All right. I believe we are live on Facebook. Hopefully this is on Gender Justice's page and not my own personal one. That's why we're late. Um, but hi, everybody. I am Erin May Quaid. I am the advocacy at, director at Gender Justice, where we seek to advance gender equity through the law. And joining me today is... I'm Jess Riverman. I'm the legal director of Gender Justice. Um, and I also advance gender equity through the law. Um, yes, you do. So... The reason we're here today is I have so many questions about the legislative process and I was like mulling them all over and then I was like my coworker is Aaron May Quaid why am I trying to figure this out on my own and then I thought maybe everyone wants to hear Aaron's answers to these questions. Um, so we're going to answer my legislative questions that are probably also your legislative questions and we're also going to talk about um, the status of the anti-trans bills in the Minnesota legislature right now that, you know, the thing we keep emailing you about and you all are being so responsive and it's fantastic. And we're going to talk to you about um, why that's been successful so far and, you know, what we still need, what's still going on. Um, anything to add to that intro? No, you're amazing. And I'm also interacting as us on Facebook too. So if you have questions, drop them in the comments on Facebook and we'll make sure to answer them. Um, and thank you for explaining why we're doing this. So Jess, um, are we are we starting with the legislative process? Is that where we're starting we're, with my really cool presentation? Let's, <laughs> let's, let's first give a little background. Um, so folks who don't know, who haven't been following, so you all know like what's going on with the anti-trans bills here in Minnesota and around the country, but we're, we're gonna talk about Minnesota today. Um, so First of all, um, we've seen a bunch of trans, there's a lot of anti-trans bills around the country, some about healthcare, some about, um, I, I, oh gosh, there, there's so many. There We're are. gonna talk about sports today, um, but the, the bills that are going on around the country are really terrible. They're really important to follow, um, but the ones there's we have- 120 that have been introduced in 34 states in 2021 alone. I mean, it's, it's bonkers. Yeah, it's wild, and we're gonna we're, we're gonna focus on sports because we have anti uh, trans participation in sports bills here in Minnesota. Um, and so, what are we seeing nationally? Who's behind this trend? Just can you give us like a really brief overview of what's going on around the country? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'll start with is um, the people who are pushing these anti trans bills are not female athletes. They're not champions for women's sports or champions for girls or women in general, right? These are um, anti-LGBTQ hate groups that are pushing these bills. And the reason why is um, in order to perpetuate discrimination and allow legally for discrimination against LGBTQ people and all different kinds of people, right? They have to chip away at the idea that queer people, LGBTQ, trans and LGB people, right? We should put trans first because that's really where they're attacking the community, um, aren't worthy of the full benefits of, of living in society, right? Of healthcare, of participating in sports, of, you know, being able to live and thrive. And so they started attacking, I mean, obviously the attacks against the LGBTQ community have been ongoing. And the reason why the Alliance Defending Freedom is a designated hate group is because their standard, like their official position is that transgender and queer people should be uh, fired from their job for being who they are or um, jailed and arrested and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so the reason why these bills are happening is because they tried this already with bathroom bills. We saw this happen a few years ago. And while it wasn't successful at a state or national level, it certainly advanced the conversation and they were successful at local levels. But the problem that they identified is that there wasn't a real victim, right? The whole like bathroom predator myth was a, a clearly understandable, understandable as a myth, right? We've all been going to the bathroom. Everybody's fine. And so they regrouped and they said, okay, we got to find a victim and the problem. And they finally identified the victims of trans inclusion in sports are cisgender women and girls and the right right and the problem um, is trans inclusion in sports and so now they're back with this and picking it up with a vengeance um, to the tune of 120 bills in 34 states in four months and so that is the background of, of why and how it has nothing to do with sports it has everything to do with legalizing discrimination against trans and LGB people um, to push them to the margins and ultimately out of society. And, and we also know that it has nothing to do with actually 
any cisgender athletes being harmed. Um, it's trans inclusion has been the case. You know, we've had trans inclusion in the Olympics for, for years. We've had trans inclusion. Um, NCAA has policies for trans inclusion. The Minnesota High School League um, is a trans inclusive league and we're not seeing any harm in fact, right? When the Minnesota High School League became officially like fully trans inclusive, we actually saw participation rates in girls sports rise during that time period. So, I mean, obviously, you know, correlation, causation, you know, what I, I'm not sure. I can't really speak to that, but um, there's certainly no, um, it, it hasn't like brought about the end of women's sports by any means, right? It's Trans inclusion increases participation rates in, in girls and women's sports. And the reason for that is not like unknowable, right? If you know that the thing that you participate in is open and inclusive to all people, you can go into it knowing that it is going to be open and inclusive to you no matter who you are. Discrimination and hate is not like neatly segregated and like, you know, cemented over here to this group. Young people and adults know that if you can do this to some people, you can certainly do it to others. And so we know that um, girls participation rates in sports in states that don't have trans inclusive policies are lower. Um, and, you know, Minnesota's had the trans inclusive policy for almost a decade, right? So like, this is this is a, a non issue. Jess always says that these bills are problems in search of more problems. They're not even like in search of a solution because there's, there's no problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so um, I want to talk a little bit. So, so we know some of the bills, governors have vetoed these bills in Utah, Kansas and North Dakota. Um, but we're in a situation where veto may not be an option. Um, and I'm, we're going to explain why, like we're, we're going to go into it right now and we're going to explain like why your emails and calls are just so important. Um, and we're, we're not going to send it out today, but we're going to send out future action items for sure on this. And we really hope this will encourage people to understand what's going on and why it's so important. Like when we're emailing, it's not just kind of like, what should we do today? I don't know. Let's have people email the legislator. It's, it's actually like things are happening, things are moving, and we really need, um, we really need them to hear from y'all. So what bills are we, what bills have we seen so far in Minnesota targeting, um, transgender youth uh, athletes in particular? So there have been four and they're, um, you know, they vary from awful, terrible, horrible to I can't believe you're a person that exists and got to make a, a bill. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is Senate file 96. This is Senator Carrie Rood's bill. This bill, um, you know, when we first read it, we weren't 100% sure if it was meant to attack trans athletes, transgender youth, or if it was meant to specifically call out um, there was a case in Minnesota where two cisgender boys wanted to dance on their girls competitive dance team and the Minnesota State High School League had a policy saying that that could not happen. They sued and they won because a federal court agreed that it violated the boys right to equal protection by not allowing them to participate on a sports team when they didn't have a correlated other sport, you know, other dance team to dance on. Um, and so we thought that originally the bill was about that. It's not. It was meant to attack uh, trans youth. Um, that got a hearing in the Senate. And it, that language is now part of the Senate Education Omnibus Bill. There were uh, three other bills. One, uh, two of them are authored by the same author, Pe Representative Peggy Scott in the House. One mirrors the Senate bill that I just talked about. The other one mirrored the Senate bill, but also called for invasive genital exams for children, which is super creepy and weird and gross. And then the fourth one was, was by far the worst one. And it stands out as honestly, one of the worst anti-trans sports bill that's been introduced in the country. And it criminalizes, would, would have young people who play sports that align with their gender identity per Minnesota State High School League policy and the Minnesota constitution um, arrested and prosecuted with petty misdemeanor and misdemeanor crimes for doing so. So that, that was far and away one of the worst bills I've ever seen. Um, that was Representative Eric Lucero's bill. And it is, um, what that's it's horrible i i just i don't like how awful of a person do you have to be to want to arrest children for participating in sports and i you know i get angry sorry when i talk about it <clears throat> no it's really upsetting i mean i used to represent kids in juvenile delinquency proceedings and they'd go in front of the judge and the judge would say you know hey why don't you participate in a pro-social activity like sports so what is a kid supposed to do i mean it's just it's a misuse of the criminal legal system for young people. It's a terrible thing to do to trans kids. It's a terrible thing to do to kids who just want to play sports with their friends. Um, but we're, so let's, let's talk about this right now. Thing. Yeah. Oh, yes. One of the other nefarious things about these bills is that, right. It calls into question, it allows adults 
and parents of other players or whatever to call into question the gender of a, of a young person. And I think we can all acknowledge that the bodies and lives of black and brown girls are always questioned, right? We're not feminine enough or we don't control, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so like there is a racial overtone to this that I just think we have to talk about and have to name. Um, and it, it's harmful to all young people, uh, but they are obviously attacking trans youth and it is most harmful to them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for naming that. And 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 also, you know, I just want to say, like, for for parents who have kids who are just gender nonconforming, right? Like, how are these bills enforced? So a parent from the opposing team is upset; their team is losing, and they say, "Hey, I think that player's not a girl," right? And that could be anyone. And then, how do you prove your gender, right? If it's not birth certificate, which you can change your birth certificate, and a lot of these bills don't reference birth certificates. So then, how do you prove, you know? And and some of these bills, not not the one in Minnesota, but I don't know how it'll be enforced. Um, but some of these bills explicitly call for things like genital examinations for for children in order to play sports um if if anyone questions their gender which is just appalling um so this is something that's targeting trans youth but it can have a huge impact on really any kid out there um which is which i think goes back to like why do we see participation rates increase as discrimination goes down and it's because maybe kids are just more comfortable they get to play the sport and not be so worried about how people are going to perceive them are they going to get pulled out of the game by police you know like for playing um and it's not i laugh it's not funny um you know it, it's it's not that kind of a laugh um so uh let's talk about um what's going on in minnesota right now so you talked about a bunch of standalone bills yeah. but those standalone bills actually some of them got like pushed into what we call omnibus bills um so, so the first question I have, we're going to go into all that. In other states like North Dakota, particularly, we we've saw we saw like days and days, if not weeks, of like floor debates where like people from the community, doctors, people from around the country, they come and they testify and they say no, don't do this. Um, we haven't seen that here, but there's a reason. Can you explain why that hasn't happened in that same way here? For sure. I mean, there's two reasons. Um, one is that the uh, bill attacking trans youth that did get a hearing in the Senate, Senate File 96 in the Education Committee, was heard really, really early this year. It was like heard in February. And so this was before I think um, people recognized that this was a national trend and that it was uh, something that we actually had to like take to the streets or go to the Capitol to do. And also we can't really go to the Capitol, so that's also part of it. Um, but and then there wasn't a lot of notice. I think there were like, there's maybe like a day's notice before that bill got a hearing. They also the limited the speakers, right? It was two on each side, like, like they wouldn't let people right. speak. Correct. I mean, we didn't even get to testify against it either. Um, and we reached out shortly after the bill was posted for a hearing. Um, and that was on purpose, of course. Um, and so that, so part of it was that the, the only bill that got an actual hearing this year happened really early. Um, and the second part is that the bills in the House did not get hearings. The chairs of the education committees where these bills would have been heard have no interest in furthering this rhetoric or this policy. And so they didn't get a bill hearing. And so we also didn't have like an action to take around a bill getting a hearing in a committee after February. Okay. Um, and so are there any trans sports bills live in Minnesota right now? I had mentioned like omnibus. So can you explain like what is the status in the House and the Senate of these um, efforts to bar trans youth from sports? Sure. So I feel like is this where I should do my my presentation? Yeah. It's okay. well. First, you need to sing the Schoolhouse Rock song, and I then not, you, do the you need to sing it. <laughs> Just okay, a I'm, bill. I uh, I made a presentation, and I'm going to give it right now. So this is kind of how a bill becomes a law. So you have a bill that's introduced and each chamber gets a copy. So you have one in the House of Representatives and one in the Senate. And so we'll we'll follow along the House of Representatives first. So let's say this is a bill for year round school for students in Minnesota. Well, it's gonna go to the committee and it's gonna go to a committee of jurisdiction. That's the education committee. And the education committee hears it and they're like, actually, we don't want year round school. We want rotating biennium year round school. So they amend the bill in committee to say something different than what it said before. So then it moves out of committee and it goes to the entire House of Representatives for a vote. So that bill comes out with rotating every biennium year round school. This is my example. So same bill in the Senate. Uh, it starts out with year round school 
goes to committee. Everyone in committee is like, this bill's great. It's perfect. It's fine. Nobody changes a thing. And then it goes to the entire Senate for a floor vote. But then on the floor, there's a senator that wasn't in the education committee. And it's like, I actually want it to be, um, instead of year-round school, we're just getting rid of school altogether. So now, it, I don't know, or we're getting rid of, um, you know, spring break or, or summer break or something like that. Different, different, whatever. He's all over the place. Yeah, this guy doesn't know. First there's no school, then there's no break from school. Exactly. It's a both and. Um, so now we have two bills that are wildly different that came out of each chamber. And so at that point, each body, the House and the Senate, appoint a few members to what we call a conference committee. And the people who are on the conference committee are called conferees. And so people who are on the conference committee, their job is to reconcile the language between the two bills and come back out with a final version, identical, that goes to each chamber, and each chamber can vote up or down, yes or no. Um, you can't change it after that point. It's just, it's what the conference committee came up with. That is essentially how a bill becomes a law. I mean, then it goes to the governor can, for signing. Can you and keep this, keep this up? Sorry, go on, yes. but keep this up. So what's happening now is that um, Senator Rood's bill to bar trans youth from playing in sports that align with their gender identity went through committee. It was not amended. And instead of going to the floor for a vote on its own, it was tucked into an education omnibus bill that contains a whole host of other bills about education. And the reason that the legislature does this is because we have a part-time legislature. So we are in session from about January to May every year. And so it actually is incredibly time consuming to take one single bill through this entire process to the end. And so they will put subject matter material together, education, um, health and human services, uh, the environment committee, judiciary, civil law. And so a committee usually will produce its own omnibus bill that contains all of the things from that committee that they would like to see become law. And so Senator Kerry Rood's bill is part of the larger Senate education omnibus bill. It is not part of the House education omnibus bill. And so that both bills already had votes on the floor. Um, we're we're going to clip and send out the senators in the Senate spoke so beautifully about why they should remove the anti-trans language from it. But now there's going to be a conference committee. So we are here with the anti-trans language. It is in the Senate omnibus bill. It is not in the House omnibus bill. And we're going to have to do some lobbying of the conferees to make sure that it does not come out of conference committee. Um. So let me see if I can summarize. Erin's always summarizing me because usually I'm, an, I'm a lawyer talking and then she has to. So let me see if I can do that for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the House and the Senate each have their own things that they do. Um, sometimes those things that they do are big omnibus bills, like for education, for example, it's just got a ton of stuff in there. So there's not like a bill right now, there used to be, but not anymore. There's not a bill number for the trans sports bills specifically. It's part of the big omnibus bill. So back back when they were standalone, it does has have a number. A number. Yeah, yeah. But but the whole bill has. So back we 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 could you, we used to be able to say like, hey, strike down like like call your senator, tell them to vote no on SF ninety six, right? Yep. But now it's it's the entire education omnibus bill and the House version, it there was actually something they wanted to put in there, but they didn't. Um, can you talk about that? Yes. So if you I actually kind of flipped the process a little bit, but um, or like how it actually is from this example, but there was going to be an amendment. So Representative Eric Lucero put forward his bill. Um, the, the criminal penalties for young people who participate in sports bill as an amendment to the House Education Omnibus Bill. Um, but what, so the House and Senate are different. They're like the Senate is what I would call the wild, wild west. In the House, you have to post your amendment to a bill 24 hours beforehand. So noon the day before it gets a big vote on the floor, you have to post your amendment. Um, in the Senate, you just bring your amendment to the floor and, and you just put it forth if you want to. Eric Lucero did post his amendment but he ended up not, he withdrew it and he didn't even speak to it. He didn't want it offered. Basically, he never offered it officially on the floor. And I think part of that had to do with the fact that there was some organized sustained pressure um, against that amendment in particular. And I appreciate anyone who did calls or, or emails because it mattered. Yeah. 
um that that's right so we we did a we sent out an email blast and people wrote to their senators um or, or to their representatives i guess it would have been and that was withdrawn and that's really cool um but now we have the senate like aaron said we had senators really go to the mat to try to support trans youth trans athletes but um the it was voted into if it the, was kept the, in it was kept into the Senate's omnibus bill. So now we have a House bill that doesn't have an anti-trans sports provision and a Senate omnibus bill that does. And right. they need to be reconciled, right? right. Um, and that's where we're at, like, right now. And so I know we had, there was one, like, I think it was a DFL senator who voted for the Senate version, um, right. which was surprising, but actually there's a reason for that. Can you talk about why that, that was? Yes, and do you, can I stop sharing this now? Yeah. Um, the reason for that, so um, conference committee members have to vote for the bill in order to be on the conference committee, right? Why would you put somebody who hated the bill so much they didn't vote for it to figure out how to, like, I mean, you're essentially defending that version for your body, for the body, right? I am the representative of the House of Representatives for this bill that we all agreed we would do. Um, and so you do have to vote for the bill in order to be on the conference committee. So it is not uncommon to see, um, so for, you know, the the party that has a majority in each chamber controls the committee. And so in the Senate, the Republicans control the committees. So there's DFL or Democratic leads on the committee who would probably be the chair if the Democrats or the DFL were in power. And so uh, Senator Weiger, or Weiger, excuse me, um, would likely be the education chair. He's the DFL lead. That's why he voted for it. So he could be the lead for the Democrats on the conference committee from the Senate. Got it. I have two more questions and then we're gonna go to the questions from the comments. One yeah. question is in other states, like I said, Utah, Kansas, North Dakota, we saw vetoes. That may not be a possibility here. Can you explain why a governor's veto may not be an option here? Yes. So um, in the state of Minnesota, the governor actually has limited uh, veto power. They can only they have what we call the power of the purse. And so the governor can only line item like a governor can veto an entire bill. They certainly he certainly can. Governor Walls could veto the entire education omnibus bill if you wanted to. Um, but sometimes governors can go in and line item veto. So I'm going to delete this line, but I'll keep the rest of it. Governors can only veto money because they have the power of the purse. So there's no money attached to this anti-trans sports language. It's just policy. And governors can't go through and just start you know, striking policy. Um, and, and as the gender justice legal director, I want to make one thing clear. If this passes, it will absolutely cost them money because we are going to sue and we are going to win. Um, and they should probably consider that. But um, so what can the people watching, though, before it gets to that, right? We're hoping it doesn't get to that. Um, it's not like we're short on things to do on the legal team. Um, what can folks watching do to help make sure that this does not become law? So there's a few things. Um, the first is, uh, please sign up for the gender justice email list because we send out alerts for when you should contact your uh, representative or your senator. And we actually create the form. So all you have to do is put in your name and your email address and your regular address, and it sends it to, we send the letter to your senator and representative for you. Um, so please do that. The second is um, if you are the parent of, or you yourself are a trans or gender non-conforming or non-binary student, please reach out to me. I will put my email address in the um, chat or in the comments there because I will help you share your story with representative senators. And I will put myself as a barrier between them and you so that it's not just you. I will help you figure out how you wanna say what you wanna say or submit a letter for you or, or help schedule a meeting because I think it's really important that we center trans youth in this conversation and, and directly connect them to the decision makers. And, and thank you for mentioning that because it is that is like the number one, like our legislators need to meet trans kids, parents of trans kids. Like it's one thing for a lawyer to be like, I'm gonna sue you and it's true, right? I will. And it's another for Aaron to be like, here's all you need to know to fight back against this legislator. Here's how to talk about this. Comp it's, it's another thing entirely for them to meet an actual human being. Like this isn't a game, you know, it's like they're treating it like it's some political game. This is not a, a real problem, right? They're just doing it. They have to meet the real people who are gonna be impacted by this. And there is no substitution for that. Um, so we've been working closely with 
with a high school athlete who's fantastic, who's done a ton of advocacy and, and has really brought, like has really humanized the issue, I think for a lot of people. And we would be, we would be glad to help other folks do that. Um, yeah. Was there anything else, Erin? I just wanted to really like lift that up though, because that's probably the biggest one. Yes. The other thing, so the we you know we know who the conferees are, right? The conference committee uh, members for this bill, and they are um, uh, Senator Roger Chamberlain, who is the chair of the education committee, Senator Justin Eichhorn, Senator Zach Duckworth, Senator Jean Dornink, Dornink. I don't know this person. I so apologize for butchering their name. Um, and then Senator Weger. And I would, if you live in those districts, one please reach out to those conferees, right? Because at this point, those are the senators that can do something. The rest of them, unfortunately, cannot, although you definitely should reach out to them because they need to know that you care about this issue. Um, I can also help you submit a like written testimony if you want to just write an email or write a letter. I can also submit that to the conferees for you. Um, in the House, and I apologize, I have to go into like a text message to um, pull it up. But uh, in the House, it is... Um, um, Representative Davney, who's the chair of the Education Committee, um, Representative Ruth Richardson, Representative Lori Pryor, Pryor Representative Hodan Hassan, and then Representative Ron Kresha. And, you know, unfortunately, this we've seen this issue fall pretty far along party lines for, you know, I don't, whatever, it, it just is becoming a more partisan thing. It's not a partisan issue. It, it impacts every kid, uh, like, horribly, uh, regardless of what their parents or representative or senator uh, party they belong to. Um, but if you have lived in one of those districts, and I will put those names in the chat as well, that is an absolute imperative that you reach out to those members because they are specifically the people who are reconciling that language. Um, and we're going to send out, right, like when we're going to send out more emails, you know, encouraging people. Um, we really hope that when you all see those emails in your inbox, just know we send them when the when um, there's something going on, when the timing's right, we try to make it easy for people to be involved. And so it'd be great, yeah, when you see one of those emails come through to, to click on it. And, um, and then- Put a oh, fine yeah. point on why, why email your legislators. I know people say that to do that all the time, but I, you know, I was a state representative and what I can tell you is that, um, you know, even if, if somebody agrees with you, giving them a story, a human story of their own constituent, like changes, how they feel about it. It takes it away from being an academic thought exercise to like, this is a real person. And also in like this COVID time, a lot of the ways that legislators interact with the public are gone. They don't have in-person committee hearings where people come in and testify. They don't have days at the Capitol. They don't have coffees and conversations in their district. I mean, that's all gone away. And so this is actually one of the only ways you can let your legislator know what you want them to do and how you feel right now. And if you don't tell them, they will not know legislators are not mind readers at all and they're just regular people so you do have to reach out to them otherwise they have no idea how you feel um and i'm uh inept at social media i tried to click on like a question and i i did something oh, weird to my facebook I um i yeah. think there were a couple questions um yeah. that i saw earlier but i am not going to try to touch them again i can read them okay. um it sounds, sometimes it feels like pro LGBTQ folks are reactionary. We get organized when we have things to fight off like these ridiculous attacks on trans people. What are some opportunities for us to be proactive and to enact good things rather than feel like we're always fighting back bad things? That's a super great question. And it's one that gender justice is really uniquely qualified to answer because we don't like live or exist or advocate or litigate from a defensive posture, but from actually a proactive posture. And so we are always, um, trying to shape, clarify, and pass laws that are good, that are proactive. And so we are working um, with a whole bunch of legislators right now on a bunch of what, of, what those things could look like. We helped, um, you know, do a briefing for legislators on like what Title IX is and like what language, because that was what the whole defense was for these bad bills. Like we're just protecting Title IX, which is not a thing, but like defining that for people. So, um, Ways to get involved, right? We'll send out emails for ways that people can like put in um, ideas and contribute to our pro LGBTQ legislative agenda that we're gonna be working with some of the legislators with over the summer and into next year, right? Law takes a long time to dig into and develop and to bring back to community. Um, and what was the other thing I was gonna we, say? I well, pulled out of my brain. Thank well, we started, we started advocating for trans athletes before the these bills started exploding. Like we actually were very, we agree, we were very much 
um, committed to not just playing defense and to actually being proactive. And so you may notice like a lot of, if you were on our email list, a lot of uh, emails about trans athletes came out before this explosion of bills. And that's because we weren't interested in sitting back and waiting to see what happened. Um, we know what the anti-LGBTQ and specifically anti-trans groups are, are capable of, and we know how low they're willing to sink. And so um, we, we've, been, we've been working on this. We also have brought lawsuits on behalf of trans athletes. So um, the NH case, we recently announced a big settlement with the Anoka Hennepin School District. They paid our client um, for damages for discrimination against him. He was a swimmer at his school and they stopped allowing him to use the right locker room. They stopped allowing him to use the boys locker room. They built a separate locker room just for him. Um, we sued them and we were successful and we will um, continue to fight for trans athletes, for trans youth um, across Minnesota. So we agree and we're, we're not we're not sitting back. And, you know, if we if we have to file a lawsuit, we will. But we 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 try to be proactive before these things um, get to this level for sure. Which is a great like plug for donating to gender justice. I mean, we the number of trips that Jess and I with our ED have been on sitting with funders being like, you gotta fund us for this work. Like they're coming after trans people. And people are like, really though? Is that really like it was a thing, it is a thing, and we've been working on it uh for years. And so this is a huge opportunity to donate to an organization that is helping us be proactive. Um, another question is trans mom here. Uh, frustrating and not sure what to do. My kid isn't into sports, but feels like this is a slippery slope for other discrimination thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. That's of course what it's about. Um, it's meant to reinforce rigid notions of gender, who is and isn't a girl or a woman, um, what is and isn't feminine, um, who is threatening and dangerous and who's not, who is des deserving a full participation in you know school and sports and education uh, and who's not. And the bills that we're seeing across the country show the full breadth of literally, I think, trying to erase trans people from existence, right? If you can take away their health care as young people, if you can deny them access to mental and physical health um, and well being, if you can tell, um, you know, there was a, a recent case that found that it was totally fine that a professor was misgendering one of his students at college, right? Like it's all meant to do that to make society not safe and not comfortable for trans people to exist. We will absolutely not have it and they are losing and they are going to lose that fight. But of course, these kinds of efforts are not about sports. They are of course about furthering the cause of discrimination and whatever name they can possibly think of. And they're using cisgender women to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a great question. Do they actually read it? I'm worried it's just interns. I think referring when we write in, I got a really personalized letters from my legislature. I got like a really personalized letter from Jim Davney. I got one from Patricia Torres Ray. I, I get the impression that a lot of them actually do read it. Um, but you are a legislator. You, Aaron, this is a great question for you. So it depends on the legislator. I can tell you one of my processes. So when I got form letters, I would get, you know, I would get the form letter and I would read it. And then I would take a lot of time to write a response that would, would go back to everyone who wrote the form letter. So it was, you know, it was specific to what they said to me, but it wasn't specific to the person because what they said to me wasn't specific to them either. It was like a statement of values. And so I would take a lot of time to, you know, think about what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. Um, there aren't a ton of interns at the legislature, to be honest with you. So in the House, um, legislators, like two to three legislators share one legislative assistant. So sometimes how it works is if you get form letters or you're getting a lot of calls, like you can tally it, but it is meant to represent like, what's the volume that's coming in. I also worked for a member of Congress when Keith Ellison was a member of Congress and we did that too. Like how many calls were we getting about a thing? Because broadly, it just said, you know, people are for or against this thing. If it was a personal story, we would take that note down too, and then pass it along to the to the congressman, and people would pass it on to me. So, it, and then it depends on the legislator because some legislators don't care, um, and so then it is a legislative assistant that's you know tallying to be like, oh, I guess you had this many people call in about this, but it still matters. That it still feels like pressure um, when twenty people call into your office about one thing, like that feels like your entire district is only talking about this thing. And and just to be clear, we have ex explicitly anti-trans organizations and anti-trans sports organization here in Minnesota. Like we we want to make sure we're writing in because we cannot have their their letters 
Like we're not interested in having like only their letters heard. These are a bunch of adults who are attacking trans youth. They go around the country pushing these anti-trans sports bills and um, testifying at other state legislators where they don't participate in youth sports, don't have kids who participate in youth sports. They're just that committed to being um, transphobic. transphobic and terrible. Um, and they're actually based here in Minnesota. So it's super important. Um, every letter matters and every, you know, it's, it's like the census, what we got, we kept our congressional seats. We had like 86, <laughs> um, 89, we, yeah. we, what 89, yeah. 89, because we like 89 more people filled out the census than like new, they did in New York, you know, it like th these things that don't feel like you're doing something, they actually do make a big deal. Um, and I didn't know that before this job because I was never a like, oh yeah, right to your Senator. I always was like, oh, whatever, someone will deal with it. Um, but now, now that I'm here and I see how it works, actually, like this, this is serious. Like we need to get rid of these bills and that's how to do it, that your, your representatives work for you. So, yeah. and we make it really easy. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I want to like, we can close out slowly in case somebody has like a burning question. <laughs> we, uh, we've talked, we've, we've rambled on for, <laughs> for long 30 enough. minutes, 35 minutes. Yeah. That's probably Woo. enough. Um, so sign up for our email list donate and then do the actions when we send them to you which we will um i will drop into the comments the the representatives and senators that are on the conference committee um and more details about that as well and, and what's our website erin we are genderjustice.us genderjustice.us um and also shout out it is lesbian visibility day so <laughs> shout out for that look at me oh, <laughs> look at us being all visible <laughs> um and yeah thank you so much for joining us thank you to thank you aaron for clarifying the legislative we we did watch the schoolhouse rock video like right before this and it helps but this is more clear i think helped you it helped me <laughs> it helped me i'm the only one with questions I, is this what it's like when you explain the law to me like where you're just like okay i'm gonna yeah it is okay that's fine no <laughs> no it's way more complex well thank you everybody um, thank you for all your advocacy, your support. We are here with you and we will keep you updated about this fight as it continues on. Um, but enjoy, is it Monday? Enjoy your Monday. I'm under the weather. I had my second shot on Friday. Enjoy your Monday. Have a good week. Thanks so much.